Hello friends, it's Michael Kingswood. It is story time on Saturday, which means it's time for Story Saturday. Uh, but we're going to deviate from the plan for this week. Uh, I'm not going to proceed forward with the story I had planned because, man, last night I told a guy that uh, January had been a month of Mondays and this week was like the week of Mondays from Monday to Monday, chock-a-block with chicanery and too much to go into but if long story short um undig undigging from lots of real life messes <laughs> all week and having a chance to record so we're going back in time to a story i wrote uh geez about 10 years ago now called brother-in-law brother in blood which uh was one of the first audiobooks i made actually because i hooked up with a guy named mark lingram uh on the the, the ACX odd author narrator hookup thing, and you read it for me. And we did this way back in the other beginning of this whole podcast when I wrote it. I read it, I think, before I had him. No, it was after I had him read it, but I didn't think to use his. I don't even remember why I read it. Anyway, point is, um, it's a fun short story about fantasy stuff, and you'll like it. And I don't have time to do anything else. <laughs> so sit back, enjoy, and I'll talk to you on the flip side real quick. The city folk stood in a wide semicircle around the edge of the bay, all eyes on the great pile that the workmen had been building for most of the previous week. Simply made, it had nonetheless been crafted with all the care that a man puts into building his own home. For there, this night, they would light the fire of remembrance, to honor those who had gone before, and particularly those who had fought and died so that they could remain safe and free. They stood silently, the reverence of the occasion muting the natural conversation that would tend to crop up in a crowd of many hundreds. Near the lapping waves of the bay, on the rightmost end of the circle, stood a man of medium height, with short-cut black hair and a closely trimmed beard, that was broken by a scar that ran down the left side of his jaw. He wore well-cut clothing that was elegant in its simplicity, and a black furled cloak to ward off the early spring chill. At his side was a slender woman who stood perhaps a finger's breadth taller than he. She was blonde, beautiful, and dressed as he was, simply, but in clothing of obvious quality. A small gap separated them from the other city folk. Though, as the couple looked at the people around them, there was no animosity there, just an unspoken respect that bade the people given them some room, however unasked for the favor was. At first the deference they showed him and Talia after the revolution made Glover uncomfortable. He had tried to stop it, to make them realize that she and he were no different than they, that any of them been in his or Talia's shoes during those terrible days, they would have made the same choices, but to no avail. They insisted on treating him like a hero, and her like the mother of liberty herself. Never mind, the real hero was their brother. At least Glover had been able to avoid being elected mayor. Some damn fools wanted to rope him into that, despite his protest to the contrary. Fortunately, Higgins was more than happy to stand for election. Even more fortunately, he won. Glover looked away from the pyre and the carved figures of the honored dead at its top. He found Higgins at the center of the semicircle, talking with the high priest and making final preparations for the ceremony. As always for these sorts of events, Higgins wore the mayor's purple frock and carried the rod of office cradled in his forearm and elbow. The high priest, naturally, was clad in gold-trimmed white robes and carried the gnarled staff that was taller than he. The pair nodded to each other, and the high priest strode forward toward the pyre. The crowd, already silent, somehow became even quieter. Even the babies at the mother's breast ceased their whimpers. For a long moment, as the holy man took his place before the pyre, the only sound was the lapping of the waves and the breeze in the trees, along with the buzzing of the evening insects. The high priest turned his face to the crowd and raised his hands above his head. 
brothers and sisters, he intoned, let us pray. All bowed their heads, communing with the Creator silently in his or her own thoughts for a long moment. When they looked up, Mayor Higgins had joined the high priest before the pyre. Fellow citizens, Higgins said in a deep voice that carried easily to the entire crowd. On this, the sixth new spring since the treaty, let us renew our resolve to remember our honored friends and family who went before, and the sacrifices that they made so that we can now know peace, safety, and freedom. In this new era that they helped usher in, let us always remember the principles they fought and died for, and resolve to keep the faith that our children will not have to suffer as we did. Remember the honored dead. Long may their memory live. Long may it live, said the crowd in unison, the first words spoken by them in many minutes. Their united voices carried over the waters of the bay to the cliffs on the far side. And a few seconds later, a more quiet, long may it live, echoed back, as though the bay and the cliffs themselves voiced their concurrence. At the echo's return, the high priest took his staff in both hands and tapped the ground at the base of two long-handled torches that were planted there for the ceremony. At his tapping, the torches sprang to light. Some in the crowd, newcomers to the religion, who had never participated in this ceremony before, or some who just got caught up in things easily, gasped softly. Glover smiled in amusement. That was a simple trick, involving the use of carefully prepared powders and the torches that react to swift vibration. But if anyone did not know about the powder... It could almost appear as if the torches had been lit by magic. Which was the point, of course. Mayor Higgins and the high priest each took up a torch and thrust it into the pyre. The wood had been carefully prepared, and it caught quickly. In a matter of moments the pyre was fully aflame, casting a great light and heat which forced the crowd to move back several paces. Mayor Higgins turned back to the crowd, smiling broadly, he made a gesture with both hands, and from behind the semicircle of citizens, bands began to play. Citizens, eat and be happy. Enjoy the bounty that their sacrifice has made possible. On cue, the group took up a collective huzzah. Then the group began to split up. Some remained staring at the pyre for some time, consumed in their own thoughts. Many others turned, and talking amongst themselves, with gradually increasing good cheer and boisterousness, made their way toward the bayside fairgrounds, where tables were laid out for all, and food was prepared. Everyone had a hand in preparing the food throughout the day of fasting leading up to the ceremony. So everyone had a claim to a meal, and was eager to partake. Glover and Talia were among those who watched the pyre for some time. Hand in hand they watched as the carved effigies representing the honored dead were consumed, and one in particular, larger than the others by a fair amount. Before it had caught fire, the effigy had been a powerful man whose face looked almost identical to Talion. She sniffed and took the kerchief from her pocket, dabbing at her eyes. Grimly would have been so embarrassed by this, she said. Glover nodded, but smirked ever so slightly. He would have loved it all the same. You know how he liked attention. But not adoration. Glover thought to object, but thinking on it for a moment, he decided how you had the right of it. Her brother had been headstrong, always the first to fight, but also always the first to laugh. He loved women and food and beer, and being the centre of a party. But he shied away from accolades. One time he had actually hidden in the back of the stables to avoid being given in an award for bravery. That was just how he was. Come, love, let's get some food. Talia nodded and sliding her arm into Glover's walked with him to the fairgrounds. There, Glover procured two plates of food. Talia took a bottle of wine and two cups. But they did not linger at the tables. Instead, they left the fairgrounds and made their way up a small hill nearby. 
From there they had a commanding view of the fairgrounds, the pyre, and the bay, while also having a bit of privacy. They sat down on the grass at the top, and Glover set up the picnic where they settled down to eat. They were silent for a while. Glover looked over at Talia and wondered at her melancholy. Most new spring nights she was jolly, but not this one. For whatever reason, she seemed to be feeling Grimley's loss almost as much as she had six years earlier. What do you suppose he would have thought of all this? Talia looked up at Glover questioningly. He always loved new spring. No, I mean all this. Glover swept his hand over the bay, the fairgrounds, and toward the city a mile distant. How the world is now. Do you think he would approve? Talia frowned and sipped at her wine. I think so. Didn't ye in him dream of a day when we would rule ourselves, not be ruled over by lordlings, whose only claim to power was an accident of birth? Glover shrugged. Not at first. You may recall I served one of those lordlings once upon a time. Talia smiled broadly. How can I forget? You were a sight to see in your armour. Swept me right off my feet. And almost got my head cut off for it, too. One of Talia's eyebrows quirked upward. Glover felt himself flushing slightly, and he looked away. Your brother did not approve. She opened her mouth to object, and he raised a calm hand to forestall her. At first. I don't understand. Ye and Grimly were tighter than thieves. He loved ye like a brother. Glover nodded. And I him, eventually. Taya's lips pursed in that way they did when she was confused, and was determined to figure out what had confused her, even if it took a month. For a second, Glover considered changing the subject, but he knew that look too well. He had planned never to tell her the story, but there was no getting out of it now. He sighed. Well, you recall when we were walking out together? He and I barely knew each other. Delia nodded. But he became friends soon enough. Glover looked at her askance. We almost did not. Until the morning after your and my full first night together. Delia flushed slightly, looking away girlishly. It was adorable how she still did that, even after all these years. Glover cleared his throat and continued. Until that morning, he and I had really not said more than three sentences to each other. I'm pretty sure he knew you and I were together, but not that it was serious. You almost lost your husband that morning. Daya's eyes widened in shock. Glover spoke quickly so she would not interrupt the story before he could start it. I stepped out of Madame Nolte's shop and smiled bouncing my purse in my hand for a moment before tucking it into my belt pouch. Last night with Talia had been wondrous, beyond my imaginings. Tonight promised to be even better. I tilted my face up into the early afternoon sunlight and breathed deeply. For a moment, I lost myself completely in the glory of it all. The best girl in the city, lord in the country, had given herself to me, promised to be mine. Life could not be better. There was nothing that could bring me down. Not today. I stepped away from the shop and made my way through the crowded street toward the battlements, where I was due to take watch in a quarter hour. Most people made way. My armor and sword, and Lord Tannenbaum's coat of arms on my tablet were enough to ensure that. All the same, it was slow going. When I finally reached the steps leading up to the city's inner wall, I only had a couple of minutes before I had to take watch. I took a step or two at a time and hurried toward the tower, not sparing a moment to look around, which is why I didn't notice Grimley's presence until he called out to me. Hold it right there! I stopped and turned around, knowing it was Grimley from his gravelly voice. I put on a smile of greeting, but it faded when I saw him. He wore the armor that his father had passed down to him, old, battered but serviceable, and a scowl that would curdle milk. He had his sword drawn, pointing at my face. Grimly, I said calmly. Why so mad? Grimly just snarled and surged forward, 
drawing his sword back to attack. I took a step back and drew my own blade, and he stopped, his eyes narrowing cautiously despite the naked fury burning within them. My mind raced. We had not interacted very often, but things had always been cordial between us. Why, tell you didn't know, come home last night. He practically spat the words out at me. Oh, no, this was not good. How had he learned what had happened? Talia did not live at home with him any more, but with two other younger lady friends. And lady friends talk, and talk gets around. This was not good at all. I really think we ought to talk about this, I said. Nothing to talk about, ye bastard, he said as he advanced again, stalking towards me with the grace of a fighting man born and bred. I, on the other hand, was newer at combat and arms than he, and I had seen him in the ring, and I was quite sure he was my better, and if I allowed this to actually turn into a fight, he would not be pulling his swings or striking for points. There was a very good chance I was about to lose my head. I tried not to think on that as I slipped to the right and retreated, keeping him at a comfortable distance, or at least a safe one. Sure there is. He cut off my words with a swift attack, leaping forward and swinging his blade at my head. I managed to duck beneath it and retreat again, but the city walls were getting closer now. Your sister is a jewel, I said between breaths. That only enraged Grimly even more. He charged again, spittle flying. I would never dream of dishonoring her, I shouted as I leapt away again. I was almost too slow. His sword cut through my tabard and nicked off my breastplate before I got out of the way. Ye will not touch her again, grimly roared. I continued backpedaling, but ran out of space as my back touched the crenellation atop the wall. There was only empty air behind me now until the moat, three dozen feet down. This was definitely bad. But just then I could not have cared about that, or the fact that Grimly was probably going to kill me. How dare he presume to dictate to me or to Talia? I glared at him. I'd say that's her decision, not yours. He snarled and wagged his sword at me. Midar's dead. Till she wed, I say what happens with her. I flexed my fingers on the grip of my sword. Talia would never forgive me if I hurt him, assuming I could, or him for hurting me. But really, Grimly... I shook my head. She's twenty-three years old, Grimly, not like she's a maiden any more. I knew instantly that was the wrong thing to say. It was one thing to know that your little sister was a grown woman who has needs, and another thing to have someone else straight out and tell you that she is no virgin, especially when that person was the man you were ready to skewer for deflowering her. Jal, you giggled. Really? He thought ye were my first. I wasn't. She rolled her eyes. Grimley's eyes widened. His nostrils flared with rage and he spat out a curse. Shut your mouth, he screamed. He charged straight at me, full speed, his sword forgotten as though to knock me over the wall. It was either stand there and be crushed, skewer him as he came, or get out of the way. I got out of the way at the last possible instant, sidestepping to the right just before he hit me. He struck the wall instead face first, then fell to the floor. For a moment I thought he had knocked himself out, or maybe knocked some sense into himself. But I was not that lucky. He shook his head groggily and pushed himself to his feet, then turned to face me again. His nose was bloodied and crooked. It probably was broken. Ye bastard! Grimly stalked forward again, his expression well past furious. Murder was in his eyes. But for some reason, I just could not help myself. I replied deadpan. I know who my father is. It's all legal and certified. Grimly blinked and cocked his head to one side, looking at me as though I had said the strangest, most confusing thing in the world. I took advantage of his momentary pause to retreat along the wall toward the tower, putting more space between us. There's no reason we can't be brothers, you know. I thought Grimly was enraged before. I was wrong. 
His face went positively beet red. He actually began to drool, he was so mad. What had I said? Your da did no touch me, ma, he screamed and charged again. He did no think that. That he did, my love. I loved him like a brother, but good Lord, he could be dense. Sometimes I'm not sure how he remembered to breathe. Dahlia giggled again, nodding a reluctant agreement. His statement took me completely by surprise. He almost skewered me before I remembered to back away again. I know that, I said in a rush. I meant your sister. One of Grimley's eyebrows quirked upward. I could tell he was confused again. Huh? I glanced behind myself. I was running out of wool, but at least I was almost to the tower. Worst case, I could hide from him inside. Maybe he would cool off during my watch. I readied myself for a dash to the tower door, but gave talking one last try. I meant, how about I marry your sister? Grimly stopped completely. He blinked. Ye do that. I made a mental note not to tell Talu how incredulous he looked right then. She laughed out loud. Was it that bad? My love, you've no idea. Of course I would, you oaf. She agreed to it last night. I reached into my belt pouch with my left hand and pulled out the package I got from Madame Nolte. I held it out to him. See? Grimly moved slowly, eyeing the package as though it were a venomous snake. Then he snatched it away, moving more quickly than I would have thought a man of his size could. He undid the tie and looked inside, and all the rage went out of him. He first looked dumbfounded. Then a big silly grin spread on his face. Brother, he cried joyfully. Next thing I knew, he was crushing me in a great bear hug. I swear to God, I thought I heard him sniffle. And sure enough, when he released me and I stepped back, there were tears in the big lug's eyes. And that, my love, is how I got your brother's blessing for our marriage, Glover said, and how he and I became friends. Dahlia shook her head, still giggling. She ran her hand through her hair, and the light from the pyre below glinted off the ring on her finger. The same simple silver band Glover bought that day at Madame Nolte's, along with its mate which he wore. Talia stretched out for a moment, and the flickering light accentuated the bulge in her belly, where their child lay growing. Grimly if a boy, or Yelena after Glover's grandmother if a girl. She then snuggled back against Glover's side. He pulled her close, and she leaned her head on his shoulder. Together they sat on the hilltop and looked down at the wide bay and the pyre at its edge. And they let the night's remembrances wash over them. After a time they stood and picked up their belongings, making ready to go home. Before they left, they said a prayer of thanks for the honored dead, but most of all for Grimley. A brother in blood, a brother-in-law, and a great man. All right, so like I said, fun story, and Mark I think did a pretty good job with it. Um, I haven't talked to him in a long time, but uh, hopefully he's doing well. Anyway, uh, we are calling it quits for today. <laughs> I've got writing to do and a whole lot of work to do today. We're playing catch up from calamities earlier in the week. Not calamities, but just like you know how sometimes it's. You, you get things rolling and then you get knocked back. And then you get things rolling, get knocked back, or just unexpected stuff comes up. Like, nah, not going to go into all the details. It's been a goofy week. And I'm way behind in cash flow. Not way behind in writing, which is good, but cash flow. So I got to hit it here uh, today <laughs> to make up for things. Uh, I'm going to let you go. Hey, don't forget, if you uh, like this and like my other stuff, go to mikekingswood.com slash store. Best store in existence where you can get all my books uh, for a much better profit margin for yours truly because you don't give money to the middleman. It comes straight to my business, which is nice. 
If you like middlemen, though, Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, all the rest, you can go to mikekingswood.com slash books to read, and that'll get you a universal book link aggregator where you can click on the title and click on which store you want to go to, and it'll be great. But, you know, obviously better come to my store. Uh, but that's entirely up to you. Don't forget to like, subscribe, to all your buddies, whether you're doing the audio podcast or the video stuff. Um, and come back next week. We will, <laughs> you know, knock on wood and, you know, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. If the, if the next week will be less crazy and we'll actually be able to get to the story I had planned to read, which is story number three out of the 52 stories project from last year, which is Odin's peppermint. I believe. Yes. Odin's peppermint, a Dustin Cofield adventure, which is fun. We'll get to it next week at this point. All right, well, hey, thanks for sticking around. I'll talk to you on the other side. Talk to you. I'll talk to you on this side. I'll talk to you next week. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs>